Hello and welcome. Um, welcome to the big letdown where we're going to be talking about a, a, a ways that our SSDs are failing your applications. Um, before I start, I want to introduce myself. I'm Pete Capusta, and I lead our enterprise sales engineering team. And throughout my career, I have led technical teams that have helped customers successfully leverage storage technology to address critical business needs. And I'll be covering the increasing challenges with SSDs and what you can do about it. Um, before I then hand it over to Jeff to discuss tuning and integration for desired outcomes. Jeff? Hello, my name is uh, Jeff Thomas. I lead our partner technical engineering team here at ScaleFlux. I've been in the storage industry for uh, well over 25 years. I've been at startups, I've been at large companies where um, we've helped automate some of the large scale deployments where customers have need to make have the need to make transformational changes to meet the evolving needs of their business. So our agenda today is, uh, as I mentioned, you know, why do SSDs fall short? Um, and it boils down to performance, capacity, scalability, even maintenance. So we're going to be covering those topics at a real high level. And then what you can do about it. And it's all about really adopting intelligent storage that can offload processing to the storage device. And then we'll go cover how ScaleFlex helps in that endeavor and uh, some Q&A. So I think we encourage everyone to uh, enter your, any questions you have throughout this presentation in the chat window, and then uh, we'll we'll be we'll have access to those at the end of the at the end of the presentation. So let me jump right into it. Um, because of their low latency and uh, and high IOPS uh, input output operations per second and high throughput SSDs have really help to accelerate many, many applications throughout the years, uh, especially when moving the SSD right into the server and closer to the CPU, which has historically been starved for data to process due to slower storage technologies or spinning hard drives or, or network latencies. So um, that's all said and, and, and good, but SSDs can't keep pace with the modern data center evolution and growth, which requires much higher performance, higher capacities, better endurance and better economics. And that's what we're going to be covering today is commodity SSDs will really let you down in those four areas around insufficient capacity, applications don't perform, maintenance issues, and then economics and footprint. So when it comes to capacity, the fixed size of today's storage devices is an issue. Edge devices are generating significantly more data, especially as we move towards um, sensor data that is just flooding the storage with, uh, with, with all kinds of things. And uh, you can't evolve workloads. So as your workload increases or changes, you really can't do anything about it. So you need to add more drives. And if you can't fit more drives in your server, you need to add more servers. And if yeah. you can't add more servers into, you know, into your rack, then you're expanding your, your entire footprint. Um, couple that with performance. You need to drive more compute through the data. And, but the intelligence is actually sitting in the server at the server CPU which is already inundated and flooded with everything it needs to do sure. with all this onslaught of data. So application latency starts suffering because the CPU can't keep up and that latency is critical to user experience of modern applications and modern, uh, even mobile applications. So the net result of that is your business applications are often missed. Uh, maintenance. Flash is a consumable device. We've already learned this as mm -hmm. we've adopted SSDs. Uh, with high write environments, drives wear too fast. And when that happens, you're no longer aligned with your server refresh cycles. So you have maintenance issues where you need to physically go and start pulling out SSDs that are no longer performing because they've been consumed to replace them with new drives. And then finally, economics and, and footprint. Um, as I mentioned already, with this sprawl where you're having to add more and more storage capabilities, data center space is at a premium. So as you add more components to your data center, power and cooling is limited. Supply chain constraints are also an issue. So we, we have customers who are experiencing significant delays because of technology shortages around the world. Um, and, and that input, it impacts you even further from being able to, to add more storage or scale out. And if you're scaling out, you can't keep scaling out forever because you're limited by, by the amount of space you have. Well, and I think we're a lot more devices at the edge and it's really kind of something that's happened in the last few years. So endurance may not be a problem with the edge devices today, but in a couple of years, we'll see how the, uh, the drives that are going in those are lasting. Right. So this is an issue that's going to keep compounding. And while you may be only seeing one or two of these today, 
it could be you're going to start seeing a second or third right. or fourth of these as, as, as we move forward. So there's been this shift to domain-specific compute in the yep. industry. This started long ago, and uh, especially around uh, heterogeneous computing. By moving a processor to an external device, you then can offload what that server CPU is doing, and you can get more functionality out of the server and why you bought it. We've, saw, we've seen this with GPUs and, and specialized processing around AI acceleration, for example. Yeah, those let you put more CPU resources in the same server chassis. It's, it's a great thing. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's just about offloading the main CPU. We've seen this with networking as well. And by putting a processor on the networking interface, uh, your network bandwidth increases. You know, 10, 100, you know, from 10 to 100 to 400 gigabytes per second. So that's another way to accelerate your entire infrastructure. And finally, if you put that at flash storage, the onboard processing enables what's called accelerated SSDs, or what we at ScaleFlux here called computational storage. And this provides for increased storage performance and increased capacity uh, to help address some of those ways that SSDs will, if they're not today, they will soon be letting you down. So every drive has a CPU on it, Absolutely. has compute resources. Yep. And, so if and I've got two drives, I got two more two more processors in there. I got 10, I got 10 more. So spot on. It's uh, helping scale out, I guess, right? It does. Uh, it, actually, almost, or scale up within a particular server. Yeah. Because you're not good. you're not scaling out into additional servers or additional uh, great point. Additional great racks. Point. So flash storage <clears throat> by moving this processor to the storage tier with flash, it really enhances four key areas. Um, and those are capacity, endurance, performance, and efficiency and savings. So let's dig into each one of those a little bit. So at the capacity tier, it really is storage optimized processing. Um, that processor allows for transparent inline compression. What that means is if you're using host space compression, you could turn that off and free up the CPU to do other things that are more important to it and have the storage tier do all that compression for you so you can expand how much you're storing on a particular drive. And um, you can store up to four times. So depending on your mm -hmm. workload and the compressibility, you can take an eight terabyte drive and make it store 32 <clears throat> terabytes without any application changes, without doing anything different, just by putting this new modern intelligent NVMe drive into, into the mix. Um, endurance. Uh, when you write less data because you're compressing it, as we mentioned before, flash is a consumable device. If you write less data, flash lives longer. And now you can mm -hmm. better align your server refresh cycles with your drive refresh cycles because the drive lasts longer. And we've yeah. seen significant improvements in endurance of you know, three, four, five X because of the ability to write less and compress that data. And performance. Now this sounds counterintuitive, but when you're, compa you're already compressing the data and you're creating more endurance, um, you would think that performance would suffer. But uh, flash can be written to or read from very, very quickly, but not at the same time. So when you're mm -hmm. writing less, you're opening up more read cycles. So in real world environments, you can have up to 5x performance, and not only that, but it stays consistently high IOPS and consistently or insanely low latency, right? Because <laughs> it's right in the server, yeah. close to the <clears throat> CPU, which will help you exceed application SLAs. Yeah. And then finally, efficiency and savings. You know, it's all about, you know, there's a budget for your data center. And you, can, you can't exceed that budget, not only fiscal budget, but also a power budget. So you want to make sure you, you're using every component in that infrastructure as efficiently as possible. The smaller the footprint, the less power, less cooling, um, and you get more work per watt and more work per second. Hmm. But most importantly, you get a lower cost per gigabyte stored when you're able to compress the data and, and, and do that right at the storage tier. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and now doing all that, <clears throat> the data becomes the source of optimization in your infrastructure, not anything else. So it really is, like I mentioned already, plug and play, zero application changes to really take advantage of some of these things. So um, great points. And uh, a customer can find one of these and get great benefit here. But we were talking to uh, a customer that was trying to grow their subscriber base, and they found that their databases were uh, capacity constrained. They couldn't grow it on the, the same server footprint. So they worked with their existing drive vendor and figured out a plan to add two more drives to each one of their systems. Great. They placed an order for 400 drives. You know what they found out? What? Three to six month lead time. 
So then now they're hamstrung. They can't. And we've stay. heard, yeah, we've heard even longer, longer lead times than that. Um, we were able to give them, get them drives much more quickly, a matter of a couple, two or three weeks. And once they got them in to their infrastructure, put them in their test lab, they actually figured out they could use less drives per server. And these latency issues that they couldn't quite pinpoint just went away. Um, so it was kind of a win-win. They bought it. They, they kind of went with this for one reason and then found some of the benefits uh, that were very tangible out of, uh, out of being able to have less latency yep. in their application. That's, That's fantastic. And by, by also, by default, they've future-proofed their future expansion because now they can keep expanding within their current infrastructure without having to rely on, on supply Absolutely. chain constraints. So, yep. so that's great news. So um, there is something called <clears throat> this commodity SSD trade-off triangle. There, there are similar triangles in all industries. Um, so most often, if you're trying to increase capacity, uh, very uh, likely you will not also experience a lower cost. You're going to have to pay more to increase capacity, mm -hmm. or if you want to have higher performance. So you, you may have to choose between one or two of these issues right, to achieve your desired results, and you're going to have to sacrifice that third one. With scale flux, there's no more compromises. You get all three at the same time. So not only do you get higher performance, you also get increased capacity, as we've talked about, because of compressing the data at the drive level, mm. but at a lower cost per gigabyte than any other industry uh, uh, option. So, yeah. And it's right in the server. And we'll dig into this a little bit more here. Yeah, we? yeah we will. Um, so what does this advanced SSD look like? It sounds like we're, we're talking all kinds of magic and, and what, the, what this is. It really is a, a, a standard enterprise NVMe SSD with Compute Engine right on the drive. Um, that Compute Engine provides transparent inline compression that we talked about. It, it provides up to that four times capacity multiplier to make that drive store four times as much. Uh, it's significantly higher performance because of how we're managing the writes and reads yeah. from that drive. Um, as I mentioned, insanely less latency, which I love that term, insanely <laughs> less latency. Uh, and then there's an, this endurance multiplier. So even if, you're, if you can't get 4x compression, any little bit of compression will allow you to get additional over-provisioning that will uh, drive additional endurance uh, for that drive. Um, and these drives are all tunable. So you can, if you want to, you can plug it in play and take advantage of it, but you can also tune the over-provisioning to, to really adjust it for what your application is doing. Right. And it comes in standard industry form factors, um, the U.2 or half height, half length. That's what the, those acronyms there stand for. Uh, Add-in card uh, in raw capacities from four to 16 terabytes today. Um, obviously, that keeps expanding as the industry evolves with yeah. the NAND flash layer. Absolutely. So now I'm going to turn it over to, to Jeff to, to really drive into tuning and integration for, for some of the desired out outcomes that we've been talking about. You bet. So if we look at the use cases and applications that uh, where we see the scale flux technology being a, the, by far no secret seeing the most uh, prevalent use cases for us. Um, we see deployments both in the data center and at the edge. And as we interact with more hyperscale and web scale customers, we're finding that the AI machine learning use cases are becoming uh, more prevalent there as well, emerging for us. And we had a, uh, a very well-known uh, customer um, that uh, we all use their, their products almost daily. They put our drives through the paces with Kafka, and they found some really, really nice results. That data that's going through Kafka, it's 4x compressible. So not only are they able to get more capacity, but they, they had some other benefits of it actually runs a lot faster. Um, when we look at some of the other you know, machine learning type use cases, which um, we, we see an intersection as well in high, high performance computing where they're using our device for scratch space. So scratch space getting written, read from quite a bit. Uh, high endurance, high performance device like this can can bring some huge benefits there. And where I'm talking about for scratch space, for key value stores, NoSQL, there's no changes to the application. They're simply using our drive instead of uh, another drive. Um, there are some ways that you can make some very minor changes and get even better benefits. And as we move up kind of the middle of the triangle here, you'll see that 
uh, things like Redis, Postgres, MySQL, they've got ways of, of making some small changes, not changing the application itself or the way that the organization's using it, but just you know changing a flag and changing the behavior of the database. So the MySQL, if, if, uh, if we enable atomic write in MySQL, uh, turn off the double write buffer, mm -hmm. which means there's about half as many writes to the drive while the database is running, gives you more performance. We protect that right, we protect the data, so we're not, we're not taking the seat belts off and going crazy, but we're doing something, merely changing a flag within the application and getting some really, really nice results. Right, so at the bottom tier, out of the box, all kinds of value. Absolutely. At the middle tier on this, on this image, you now set some environment variables, or like you said, flags, yeah. that really can take advantage of better integration, So, but still no application changes. And then at the top tier, there's some custom applications that some of our customers have done, but that that's- They you know, have, and they've seen benefits in these other two layers right. long before they go to, to do something custom Customer to make head, it work and work left. with us to do gotcha. that. Gotcha. And uh, there's really no need to, I mean, right. when you're, when you're able to get the amount of savings and performance gains out of what we have, you almost uh, it's that's all icing on the cake that right. I think we'll uh, we'll see more customers adopt over time. Yeah, and and the ones you mentioned in the middle tier there, the examples that are posted, we actually have a white paper on MySQL Atomic Rights. So it's on our website that was done by mm -hmm. a third party, along with other topics such as running Redis on Flash, for example, and and things to address. Uh, Postgres tuning uh, by, by by turning down fill factor, for example, yeah. and what does that mean for your performance? And there's all kinds of metrics that we can help you understand better yeah. around those environments. So a lot of good stuff there. Um, Pete mentioned it a few minutes ago. We have something that we call the capacity multiplier. So when your workload's compressible, ScaleFlux can give you a massive uh, some massive benefits that. They're technological benefits because you're going to have lower latency, more capacity, but from a business perspective, all the things that come with a more predictable infrastructure, stretching it farther, um, they're all, all really good stuff. So ScaleFlux, ScaleFlux can compress at line speed. And if your data is compressible, 2x, 3x, 4x, it shouldn't be a big stretch to understand cost per gig goes down. And you're probably thinking, at least I was when I first saw this, um, I, you know, I don't know if my data is compressible. Right. And I thought when you did compression that it slows things down. And you, you know, if you're going to make the jump, use a transformational technology, you need to be able to rely on it. You don't want it to let you down. So we've got a compression estimator that you can run on your data set. You can, it, it's non-disruptive. You can see if the data is compressible. Um, and Pete and his team can make this work for you, help you out with it, uh, walk you through it, or it's pretty straightforward uh, for those uh, DevOps-minded folks that want to go out and figure this out. They can probably even do it without our, our tool. But, you know, I was born in Missouri, which many of you know is the show me state, right. and I had to see this stuff before I could believe it. I was, I was skeptical myself. So the scale... Flux technology, it doesn't have a performance penalty by doing compression. And its latency goes down as we compress. So even if your data is images or videos that you think aren't going to compress, even with like 1.1 to 1 compression, very, very little amount, you're going to be writing less data. Mm -hmm. And it's going to go faster. And, and that's really a great thing. I mean, it, as you get to 2 or 3x compressibility, we see 50 to 75% less latency. And it's consistent. So we've worked with a couple of, uh, of finance organizations that um, where latency is really, really important for their trading app. So not only do we have lower latency, but we keep a consistent lower latency. And that's a big deal for them because that increased performance keeps the users of those systems they're happier. They're, it's predictable how how the system's going to run, and you know, their them and their management, the, those users are very happy with what they're getting out of out of these out of these drives that are in the systems. Right. It, it impacts the end user experience, and yeah. that'll ultimately, if if your app is not performing, 
because you can't get updates to your stock ticker symbols, yeah. you're going to go to a different app. So variable length flash translation layer plus writing less to the media equals faster response times, more performance. So it, it is, uh, it's, it's magic in how simple it is that right. we're employing something like, you know, ordering the coalescing and ordering the rights and then writing less. And that's what gives us the big performance boost. See the same thing with IOPS. Your IOPS are going to go up as your compression goes up. Um, you will see lower latency with this device in, in almost all times. So, you know, in, in the theme of our, our webinar here, if you seek fulfillment <laughs> from your drive vendor as opposed as, to a letdown, as opposed to a letdown, yeah, um, you should try it yourself. And uh, I encourage everyone out there to claim the free drives that we're offering at the end of the session so that you can put it in and see it for yourself. Yeah, and we'll have the link if it's not up on the screen already. We'll have the link at the end for everyone to, to claim two drives to try this, try it themselves. So what were you saying before about reads and writes mm. and SSDs? Yeah, so Flash is awesome. It's fast. Mm -hmm. You can write to it. You can read from it super fast, much faster than hard drives, but not at the same time. Okay. So writes can block reads. Correct. Probably vice versa, but more so you're, you're gonna, your read performance is going to drop when you've got a mix of writes within there. So we have DRAM on the, on the drive in addition to the processor. That sits in line. We coalesce the writes. And that means that you're not let down by our flash drive because you get a... Uh, a mixed workload and what we're looking at here on the screen on the far left 100% read writes on the x-axis on the on the right 100% random writes and there's plenty of applications out there where you're writing to the SSD and then you're reading it a ton the, a lot of that out there but um, there's also a lot of, of applications where there is a mix of read write you know databases uh, being one of the, the main use cases there. So with as little as 10% right, so where you see there our arrow there where it says better, um, tw as little as 10% rights, you're getting 25% better performance. And as you get to 30, 40% rights, you're getting 60 to 70% more performance. That's huge. And that's why that's why our customers love us for databases because right. they've they've had to build out infrastructures in particular for these NoSQL databases that are sitting over outside of the the rest of the infrastructure because they need sort of a special build to be able to do this. They need the data inside the machine, and uh, this is a perfect perfect device for those those environments. Yeah, and it's important to note that benchmarks you know canned benchmarks can really skew data, and but when you look at real world performance. No one's running a benchmark on your application. You're running right. real world, and you want to make sure that you can continue to operate in a 70, 30, 60, 40 kind of mixed yep. workload where databases really, really shine. Yeah. Well, so as we, as we kind of start to bring this home and wrap it up, um, we are, we've got tangible results from our customers. We're, we're, we can share them with you in kind of a one-on-one -on -one basis, but all of our customers they see a capacity increase, which translates into cost savings. They all see consistently lower latency. So if, you're, if, if you care about your databases and you're, you're a DBA, you want more transactions or queries per second, you'll be amazed at what this device does for you. It, it's really, really, really substantial. Um, endurance improvements, as we talk to a lot of customers, endurance sometimes matters, but where you do have a an application like Redis that does do uh, a lot of reading and writing, rewriting to the drive, uh, having more endurance, we, we've seen some pretty tangible results there. Yeah, we had a customer swapping out a drive every 11 months, and now they can do it along with their server refresh cycle. Yeah. So that's great. So... Um, as the slide says, hashtag it's not fair, right? Yeah. It shouldn't be this easy. It shouldn't be this easy to implement real world solutions that work today and continue to evolve yeah. as workloads and modern data center requirements um, you know, continue to, to put a tax um, on, uh, on your current infrastructure. So it's all about the capacity, the performance, the endurance uh, and efficiency. 
Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, we have a link posted on, on, on the screen right now uh, at the bottom there, and we'll have it available for everyone as a follow-up as well. Uh, you know, I encourage everyone, you know, don't take our word for it. There's some cool, compelling slides here that yeah. Jeff shared and some cool concepts that I shared. But, you know, this is all about real world scenarios and everybody's workload is a little bit different. So we encourage you to try it for yourself and not take our word for it. And by, by clicking on the link or, or entering that, that thing uh, and get to the front of the line because, you know, we have a limited number of drives and we're offering two free drives for anyone who wants to try this in their own environment uh, under your own workload. All right. So great. So um, I, I think we can uh, go to some some questions. Um, I'm seeing one here, and uh, as uh, I didn't introduce my uh, part of my introduction, I, I didn't say all the companies I've been at before, but I spent some time uh, with a, a startup that uh, became part of EMC before the Dell acquisition called Scale.io. So some of my Scale.io friends are asking me, how's this different than Scale.io? Um, Scale.io is something you put on top of your your commodity infrastructure, and you drive a huge amount of performance from it. What we have is a device that has an additional processor on it that is doing inline compression. <clears throat> We've got stuff coming out very shortly that will also do inline encryption with no performance penalty. So you'd really think of scale IO could be something that takes a bunch of um, our drives inside server chassis and stitches together a software to find a ray. So they could they'd certainly be complementary. Right. Um, we haven't tried it yet, but I'd be uh, be happy to work with anybody that wants to uh, show how good it goes. Yeah, and and you know we maybe we didn't stress this enough, but this is a block level device that plugs right into the server and works like any other NVMe SSD with additional benefits. Yeah. Without making any additional changes. So it looks like another question: um, How does transparent inline compression work so I, I i had a couple of sentences in there where i talked about that but we essentially have dram on the on the drive as well we use that as a place to buffer the data coming in we route it through a processor that does uh, fairly intense robust encryption and then we push that we order those writes and we push them down to the drive so it's a combination of us routing the data through a cache that is, is battery backed, capacitor backed, I should say. Mm -hmm. and, then, um, and then we order it and write it down. And there's the processor that's on every drive that's doing that. And as the charts show, no extra latency is introduced in this process. Actually, we're reducing latency, latency. and improving performance by yes. doing so. Absolutely. Uh, the question I think is the next one coming up is how does someone get a drive to try? Um, well, the link at the bottom of the screen here is a, a way to fill out a, a form uh, to request two free drives for yep. your particular use case and your evaluation. Uh, we'd be, and my team will help you uh, if you need the assistance. Uh, yep. This is straightforward, but if you need the assistance to help identify the right use case or how to install it or maybe take advantage of some of those environmental variables, uh, we can leverage a lot of those um, uh, details to help you succeed you bet um, so a little more uh, questions digging into um, what kind of processors on the device so what we ship today uh, there's a Xilinx FPGA on the on the device that mm -hmm. uh, that does the compression what we have coming out in the near future will actually we're, we're switching to an arm based processor that will um, um, give us even more capabilities uh, both now and in the mm -hmm. future so as our our gen 4 device delivers we're actually building it kind of to the some of the gen 5 specs so we're trying to kind of jump ahead of our competition in fact we've had uh, customers do performance tests where our gen 3 drive shows better performance than our competitor gen 4s uh, especially in the IOPS right because of the, the that back the 70 40 70 30 60 40 environment and it talked about and and whether we're, we have both QLC and TLC yeah I mentioned raw device sizes before mm -hmm. 4 to 4 to 16 terabyte um, we do have both TLC and QLC devices so yeah. we have a uh, you know a larger 
uh, data scale that focuses on capacity as well as um, uh, the TLC for higher performance. So we have both. Well, and, and we mentioned something about uh, tunable over-provisioning on one of your slides, mm -hmm. Pete, and we can actually change the over-provisioning. So if you want your, um, your, we can make a QLC drive last longer. Sure. Or we can take a TLC drive and make it be much bigger, have more performance, and you know we're going to warranty things like any other any other drive manufacturer drive rights per day. It's actually total um, bytes written, right? So right. And, and then there's an, there's a calculation that gives you drive rights per day, but it it averages over three drive rights per day. So these are really enterprise class. These are not commodity that would you would buy at your local electronics store. These right. are really server enterprise class SSDs. Yeah. So uh, let's see if there's uh, other questions coming in. The, um, there's a question about um, IBM drives and uh, will they, are we as fast as those? Um, there are, there's lots of technologies out there. There's lots of stuff emerging. What we're seeing though is anybody else that's either has a chip that they're putting on the drive mm -hmm. or they're routing stuff through an FPGA, um, if it's a mixed workload, mm -hmm. these implementations work faster. Um, when you start looking at 100% reads, sometimes there are um, there's devices that'll go faster for reads, quite right. frankly. But if you have a mix, this is going to perform a lot better. So I know, uh, you know, from my history, I've done a lot of work um, with arrays, array-based technologies, yep. whether they're 12 disks in a JBOD or whether there's thousands of disks in a, in a high-end array. And we often get asked by customers, do, do we support, you know, can you get our disk in an array? Um, today, not yet. Um, we're certainly working with some manufacturers. In fact, there's some uh, right near our, our headquarters here in San Jose that are looking at us. Um, and I think we'll start to see some of these um, drives that have processors on it coming into the arrays in the near future. I agree. I know you've recently had discussions yep. uh, about um, But when you, when you think about this as well, your array manufacturer is typically three or four years out looking at the drives they're going to put in the system that's going to ship when that product goes GA. So we're just starting to have some of those conversations. So. Um, I, I expect that we'll see some in, in two or three years in some of the major arrays. And then I think, you know, being focused on partners, I've seen some of our partners taking um, commodity servers, open source software, and using our drives to create uh, solutions that they support for their customers. Right. So we'll see that a lot more in the, in the near term. I think the most recent question was about so let me read Samsung Smart SSD. Um, you know, we have to also stress that we're on our second generation shipping product that's been shipping for over two years now. Mm -hmm. So we have customers that have deployed thousands of these drives. It's not uh, in beta. It's not something new. And it really is integrated with all the technologies that we do. So we build these drives ourselves, uh, design them from scratch, uh, and integrate with the flash manufacturers and make their flash better. So. Um, you know, can we directly compare to some other technologies in the industry? Uh, we'd have to look at the use case yeah. around what, how it's being used. But we can tell you that, yeah, as Jeff already mentioned, we warrant our drives, we support our drives, and it really is uh, a, an integration point for a production uh, environment. Yeah. And our, our next generation drive is going to be a third gen. And yeah, and we're, we're really kind of pioneering the yeah. use of computational storage. Absolutely. And, and the big boys are going to follow our lead, they are. be the, the fast followers there. So I think um, it's we kind of come to the end of our webinar. We appreciate everybody being here. It's been uh, fun talking to you about this stuff and certainly you know how to find us now if you, yeah, if if you made it to our webinar if there's we'll, any uh, other questions uh, don't hesitate to reach out directly yeah um, as well and uh, can you replace uh, what's, what?
The last question is coming in at, at the, in the eleventh hour. Here is: Can we replace <laughs> our existing NVMe drives with ScaleFlux drives? And the short answer to that is absolutely yes. Yes, that is a resounding yes. It is an NVMe drive with additional intelligent processing on board to do all these other yeah other things. All right. So that's it for us. Thank you very much for joining, and uh, we look forward to working with you.